my friends, it's Friday, and you know what that means. It's time for Biblically Speaking, the program where we look at our life through God's Word. Now, today on the program, we're going to be looking at the book of James and looking at three important lessons that James teaches us about faith and how we can apply them in our daily walk with Jesus. So, this is going to be a great starter lesson if you're looking to start those conversations with people about the gospel it's going to be an encouraging study and it's going to be one that i think you'll want to watch over and over again because we all need that daily encouragement and we all need those kinds of daily reminders that we are pressing towards something better so whenever you happen to be watching this whether it's the premiere and you're watching it live or you're watching a little later in the weekend. I want to thank you for being here. Hopefully you've got a cup of coffee. Always important. Hopefully you have your Bible. Even more important. And hopefully your mind is ready to study God's Word. I'm looking forward to it. So let's get into it. Beginning with a word of prayer to our Father. Our great and heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have given us your word, that you have given us strong encouragement to run our race with endurance, that you have shown us that there is a value to the hope that you have set before us that makes our struggle in life to follow your Son worth more than the pain that we go through. And Father, we are so grateful that we have your Son Jesus as an example and help us, Father, to imitate his faithfulness every day of our lives. Help us, Father, as we strive to please you in our daily walk with him. Help us, Father, to contemplate his faith and to know that he is the example of joy in difficult circumstances. Because though he endured the pain of the cross, he did so seeing what you had, what you were purchasing with his blood. And for that joy, he, dis he endured that which was despised, and by that he has become our high priest, our Savior, and our King. Father, help us to think about that in our daily walk. Help us, Father, to follow him the way that sheep should their shepherd, trusting in his guidance. And even though our path is overshadowed by death, we know, Father, that the place that Jesus leads us to is a place of quiet waters and green pastures. Father, we ask that you would help us to trust you as our rock, as our refuge, for you are our mighty warrior, and you are a wall of fire for your people. Father, keep us in your hope, keep us in your grace, and be merciful to us, and help us to find the right way when we depart from it. In Jesus' most holy name we pray, amen. All right, so we're going to start this morning, or this afternoon, uh, with a look at the very first verses in the book of James. and we're, So we're going to start in James 1, and we're going to look at the very first remark that James makes here after the introduction in verse 1, where he says in the second verse, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect work so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, depending on your translation, there were probably some words in there that, that were a little different from the ones that I read. Instead of endurance, it might have said patience instead of, and I accidentally said the word work there, but instead of uh, work, it might say perfect result in verse 4, but the thought remains the same. So what James is telling them here is that their faith is about to be tested, but not to fear the testing of their faith, because if their faith is what it should be, if it is of the substance of the things that it should be, then enduring those difficulties, enduring those tribulations, enduring those things, and keeping their faith intact will result in a faith that is a stronger faith. In fact, it says that it will that the result of, of this endurance that it talks about here, and that word endurance 
uh, literally means steadfast or, or patiently waiting. The, the outcome of their patiently waiting on God or their steadfastness toward God is, is, the, uh, is that they, they will be perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. And so, I mean, that, that's a pretty substantial reward if you stop and think about it. And, and you've, you've uh, probably thinking about some verses, maybe like Matthew 5 and 48, where Jesus at the end of that first section of the Sermon on the Mount says, be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect. But, but the first lesson that I see in the book of James is that faith has a purpose. And and the purpose of faith really gives us a different perspective on things, that it changes the things that we might otherwise be ashamed of or frustrated with or angry with into a into a source of joy for us. Now, I, I don't want to be obtuse in any kind of way. I'm not saying that suddenly we're overjoyed that we're suffering. That's not what James is getting at here. But what he's getting at is that through faith, we see the result of the testing. Now, our world looks at difficulty, it looks at tribulation, it looks at the frustrations and and even even the the, the mundane nature of life, and it, it sort of throws its hands up. But that's not how the Christian behaves. That the Christian, when his faith is put to the test, the the image here is of one who is rising to the occasion to patiently wait on God. Now that doesn't mean that we don't ever do anything or or it doesn't mean that our our faith doesn't have action cuz it's the second lesson. But the first lesson in faith is that it does wait on God. And and it I think about how many of the psalms uh, start with that phrase, how long, O Lord, because David or one of the other psalmists is, is waiting on God, and he is, he is committing himself to continuing faithfully in God's Word. He's committing himself to continuing faithfully uh, serving God and obeying God. He's committing himself to remaining in the presence of God, even in the middle of difficulty, but he's still asking that question, how long, O oh Lord, how long before you deliver me from my enemies, or how long, O oh Lord, before you punish the wicked, or how long, O oh Lord, before you vindicate your holy name? And I'm just thinking of all the different examples throughout the Psalms. That one of the first lessons in faith is that God acts on his timetable, not ours, his. Not when we think God should act, but when he knows that it's right for him to act. And you sort of think about, uh, you know, what is it, Galatians 4 and 4, where the Apostle Paul says, in the fullness of time, that, 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 um, or let's see, Romans 5, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, that God has his time to act, and he has that charted out, and he knows when he's going to intervene. Now, when God is not intervening, when we would like him to intervene, when maybe we've been praying fervently, and I know a lot of us have been uttering a lot of prayers over the last year about the the, the situations that have embroiled our world. I know a lot of us have, have prayed very fervently over this last year, and still we're waiting patiently for God to answer. That's not the time to lose your faith. Now, this is also probably not the thing that James is talking about when he's telling them to endure patiently, that that kind of endurance probably had to do with, with the, since he's writing, if you look at that very first verse of the book of James, to the 12 tribes who were dispersed abroad, that he's, he's writing to more than likely Jewish Christians here. I don't think he's using, using the 12 tribes metaphorically to talk about us all being the children of Abraham. I think he is writing specifically to Jewish Christians here because they were suffering under the hands of their former brethren. And so they were suffering at, they were, that. I mean, you think about the Apostle Paul holding, when he was Saul of Tarsus, holding the coats of the men that were stoning Stephen. It's to those people that James would have been writing, to the people that were suffering under the yoke of oppression, and the people that were oppressing them were their own brethren. So how do you deal with that? Do you lash out against them? Do you attack them? Do you... Do you fight back against them? What, what do you do? You, you wait for God. And you know, that's a real lesson for us, that our world demands sort of a quick response, that, that we appreciate people that give this quick response, that have 
sort of that loaded wit that always know the right and hurtful thing to say at any particular moment to score that that point in the argument and gain that victory that neither side will ever acknowledge. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. But that's not the example of faith. The example of faith is is not looking for looking to glorify myself above other people. It's certainly not looking to to uh, to undo the circumstances that I might be enduring because of my faith, but rather the 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 description of faith that I see here is that it endures these things and it waits on God. Now, need a little more proof of that. Look at what he says next. But if any of you lacks wisdom, verse 5, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. And so, again, what we see is if the situation becomes one where we need the guidance for how to endure this, then we ask God, and and God will give us the wisdom that we need. He, he reveals how we should handle those kinds of situations in his word. But we shouldn't doubt the answer when we get it. We get it. It's still the first lesson, by the way. We shouldn't doubt the answer when we get it. We shouldn't go looking for something other than the response of faith when we when we find that answer. Because when we do, we shouldn't expect that that God's going to bless a different way because we didn't like the answer that He gave. Then you sort of enter into this this discussion about the kinds of gifts that God gives and how he's going to he's going to humble the wealthy and he's going to to the that would be those who would trust in this world and its goods and he's going to elevate those who are who are despised by the world the poor of the world the the that those that, that know how to trust him be, because they trust him on a daily basis that those are going to be the ones that are elevated and God gives good and perfect gifts and he comes down to this thought that I still contend, I would contend that it still goes with this first lesson uh, in verse 22, where he says, but prove yourselves doers of the word. Remember, we were, when we were talking about the word, we went back to uh, God to ask for wisdom, how to deal with, with the things that we didn't understand how to deal with. How does faith respond to these things? Look at what he says in verse 22, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So there's something going on, and we are asking for God's guidance in it. We, we find the guidance of God. We find how God wants us to respond to that. We see the corrections that we could make. We see the, the, the steps that we could take to be better at this endurance. And then we walk away and we forget it. Well, that's the double-minded man who's unstable in all his ways. But the one who does the word of God, the one who puts that word into practice, that's the one in verse 25 that will be blessed in what he does. And so the, the first lesson that I really want to, to try to put all of that together into one thought, it, it, it's... It's not about the endurance, and it's not about it's not about asking God and God giving, and it's not even about doing what's in the Word of God. The first lesson that I see in faith is this: that it it changes where we look. That when you think about the very first passage that we looked at, where he told them, "Count it all joy." or consider it a joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. The very first thing that he told them there is that faith changes our perspective on things. That's why we go to God looking for his wisdom. That's why we do the thing that we find in the word that might be counterintuitive to the way that we think that we should do it. That's why we don't doubt God when we see his response to the questions that we ask, because faith changes our perspective. So the joy is not because we exist in the trials. The joy comes because we see, and I mentioned this earlier, 
the outcome of those things. Now, what's interesting, and I mentioned this in the prayer, is you see a very similar statement in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, <clears throat> beginning in verse 2, this is right after he's talked about the cloud of witnesses that surround us and how we need to, to take on their example of laying aside this, the the sin which which or the encumbrance and the sin which is entangling us so easily that we need to run with endurance the same word that we saw over there in James that we need to run with endurance uh that that's that steadfastness that waiting on God the race that is set before us and then it says this in verse 2 fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and and perfecter of our faith that idea of fixing our eyes on Jesus is locking Jesus in our gaze and and the idea there is that we're going to, or the thought there, is we're going to imitate Jesus, that he's this perfect example of endurance. He's this perfect example of laying aside the hindrances. He's this perfect example of laying aside the encumbrances and of overcoming sin, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The only way that faith works, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, is if it changes where we're looking. If we're still looking for the best that this world has to offer, if we're still trying to attain success according to this world's standards, if our if our joy is having um, a, a perfect family or a perfect spouse or a perfect career or a perfect uh, uh, balance in the 401k or, or perfect children getting into perfect schools, life's going to shake that. Yeah, I, everybody that you know at some point, your spouse, your brethren, your children, they're going to disappoint you. But that's not who you fix your eyes on. You fix your eyes on Jesus because he's not going to disappoint you. He doesn't disappoint you. Now, I'm not not discounting your relationship with any of those people. In fact, if anything, we need to be more patient with them because they are only human. But Jesus is this perfect example of enduring faith. And what do we see, what do we learn about faith from Jesus? Well, it takes a hard thing. It takes a despised thing. It takes something that is seems nearly impossible to endure and it causes us to look past that thing to the joy that's on the other side. So the question that I would have is, what joy is there on the other side of faith? Well, it would be the joy that we saw in Hebrews 11. You remember that, that, that the patriarchs were seeking that enduring city whose builder and maker was God. It's not just, we're not just looking for a time when things go back to normal. Where, and I mean, quite frankly, most of my life, if you look at human history, the kind of luxury and the lack of hardship that I've lived in most of my life would not be considered normal in the scope of human history. That, that we're not looking for things to go back to normal. We are looking for things that are above. And, and that sort of resonates with, with Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, if you have, di if you have died with Christ... Keep, seek, keep seeking those things which are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, that it really puts that verse into perspective, that the first lesson in faith is that faith is not belief. Faith is a steadfastness in our confidence in God that helps us to look past the hardship and see the perfect result at the end, which is this closer relationship with God, this closer relationship with Christ, this deeper confidence in our salvation. Now, James is not done with faith yet. We're going to come back to it again in a big way in chapter 2. If you want to be turning over there, James chapter 2. And once you get there, we're going to start in verse 14. Now, he's just sort of gone off on this tangent about, about dealing with brethren of lesser means and how, we, how they, they should be regarded as, 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 uh, as brothers and sisters and not, and not treating them as lesser class and, and deferring to those who are wealthier that are, 
that are prob in the case of James is probably dealing with people that are still practicing Jews that are trying to throw them into prison. Uh, and so not holding their faith with partiality. In fact, chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. And so, so he begins this discussion that we're going to get into in verse 14 with this thought that, that faith has action attached to it. That it's not just, this isn't just a discussion of faith and works, but the action specifically within James 2 is, is, that, is that not only is faith trusting in God's ability to deliver us, but faith is also tantamount to loving the people of God. In fact, let's just take a look at that beginning and take a look at a couple of those verses in chapter 2, verse 1 and following before we jump down to verse 14. It says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing fine clothes, and say, You sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, You stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Now, that's not the, the last time he's going to talk about judges with evil motives in the book or becoming a judge that we shouldn't be. Listen, my beloved brethren, did God not choose the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? And so that's really sort of the, the lesson there is, is this man who comes into the assembly who's a brother in Christ and he doesn't have much, he's a better testimony of faith than somebody who's just kind of, who's very wealthy, he's a member of the Jewish society, he's just kind of dipping his toe in the water with this Christianity thing, and and he'll probably retreat because it's going to end up costing him um, his influence or something of that nature. He says, he says, don't treat that brother of humble means in a way that is condescending to him, but rather look at him as this example of he's trusting in God. And so, uh, or as an example of trusting God, I guess I should say. But when you look at that, what you see is, again, this is faith is, is changing the way we look at things here. But not only that, look at what he says in verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Now, remember what we just talked about, that, that our faith in God is evidenced by the way that we love the people of God, right? He's going to spin that into a bigger lesson here. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, notice he said brother or sister. He's talking about people that, are, that, are, that share their faith. And one of, them, one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Now, I want to stop right there. Uh, and I want to say this, I want to say this very clearly, that when you look at what he says in verses 14 through 16 of this chapter, James is not giving you an example of faith and works. James is giving you the practical application of loving your brethren and showing your faith in God. He's, it's not just not just an example of, okay, here's this example of saying, you know, if you tell somebody be warmed and filled and don't give them anything, then, then they won't really be warmed and filled. Yes, he is doing that, but it's also the practical application of the thing that he just talked about, about showing deference to those who come to you trusting God. They're fellow heirs of Christ. They come to you trusting God. Well, what should your faith do? Their faith brings them there. Their faith is, is, is causing them to be steadfast. I mean, they, they would probably have a much easier time of finding the things for their daily need if they just went back to being practicing Jews and worshiping at the temple and things like that. But they're enduring. They're trusting God. Well, what's the practical application for those who don't have that struggle? Well, the practical application is you can say that you love them, like fellow heirs in Christ, but the evidence is in whether or not you meet that need, whether or not you're taking care of your brethren. And then, I told you this is going into this bigger application. The bigger application of this, and it shows up in verse 17, even so, 
Faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. So the, the practical application is also the example, and here's the lesson that faith, if faith is also tied to loving the brethren, as we saw that it was at the beginning of chapter 2, then faith without the works is dead. So let's talk about some practical applications of that. I can say that I trust God. I can say that I'm going to wait on God. But if the evidence in my life is that I'm constantly departing from the way that God tells me I should go, that I'm constantly departing from the way that Jesus leads his people in, then the evidence of faith, the works that are associated with it, are not there. If I can say I love my brethren, I can even look them in the eyes and tell them I love them. But if I am not investing myself in them, using what God has given me to meet their needs, then I don't have that love for the brethren. And that faith, that love of the brethren, that's part of faith. And James is not the only one who indicates that love of the brethren is, is, is part of our faith. Jesus was talking about that over in John 13, 14, and 15. John talks about that all throughout the book of 1 John. But if the if the I can say I love the brethren, but if the evidence is not there in the things that I do, then that element of faith isn't genuine, and that isn't then that isn't a real application of faith for me. It doesn't matter how often I tell them I love them. It doesn't matter uh, how well I speak of them. If the real application is not there, so let's go on a little further now that we. We've sort of pulled that back and we're tying the ends together. So even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. So some might say, well, you know, you have, you know, I'm, I have the works and you have the faith or, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to trust in the, maybe the works of the law there. There's all kinds of of potential double meanings in that in that quotation that he gives at the beginning of verse 18 you have faith and i have works show me your faith without the works and i will show you my faith by my works he says you believe that god is one you do well the demons also believe and shudder but are you willing to recognize you foolish foolish fellow that faith without works is useless so you have that quotation there of, of show me your faith without your works or you have faith and I have works. And then sort of the response to that, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. He says, here's why it can't just be belief. He says, you, the demons, uh, you know, the devil himself believes in God. Not only believes in God, he trembles before God. He is fearful of God. He has, he has more belief in God than most people do. But he's still the enemy. He's still not submitting to the will of God. And the practical application of that is that this isn't a, a proof text for baptism. Uh, and I'm not saying it can't be used in the discussion. I'm just saying it's not a proof text for baptism because baptism is not a work. I mean, baptism is is an appeal to God, according to 1 Peter chapter 3. It's an appeal to God for a good conscience. That it is the God canceling out the certificate of debt and nailing it to the cross. Baptism isn't my work. Baptism is actually God's work. And, and so, but the idea here is not, you need to go do a bunch of things because that means that you have faith. The idea that James is is positioning to them is that you don't have faith unless you can show that daily confidence in God by the way you live. It's not just believing that there's a God. It's not just professing that there's a God that you do not have faith if that faith does not change your life. If it doesn't change that perspective that we talked about in verse 1. And that's the real application. And so he's going to go through some examples here. He goes through the example, the example of Abraham. And, and what's interesting here um, in verse 21 is 
is Paul uses the same example of Abraham's faith in the book of Romans to talk about the importance of faith. Well, James is using the same example of faith that Paul uses to talk about uh, to talk about uh, that Abraham's faith was proven by his works. It says, was not Abraham our father justified by the works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now, that's an interesting interesting quotation there because it actually comes a couple of chapters before that before that passage in Genesis where Abraham actually offers Isaac to God at God's request. And of course we know how that story plays out. But that 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 statement that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness actually comes from Genesis 15 that that you don't get the offering of Isaac until Genesis 22. I said a couple of chapters. It's actually seven chapters. So what does it mean? Why is James associating these two things with each other? Well, he's associating them with each other because of that word in verse 23, fulfilled. That that chapter 15 of Genesis, when God was making the promises to Abraham, we're told that Abraham believed God. Well, where's the evidence that Abraham believed God? Well, I mean, there's a little evidence. He moved around from place to place as God told him to, that left behind his homeland like God told him to. But the real great evidence that Abraham believed God showed up on Mount Moriah when he took Isaac up there to offer him the way that God said to offer him. And so even though Abraham believed God, The evidence of that belief wasn't there until the moment he was willing to offer the son of promise. So then you have the example of Rahab, and it concludes in verse 26 by saying, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Now, excellent, skip verse 24. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, that's one of the reasons why so many denominations today want to want to just completely skip over James. They don't know what to do with this example because they they tend to take the words of the apostle Paul uh in passages like Romans chapter 10 with the heart one believes and with the mouth one confesses that that they tend to take the the things that Paul says about faith saving us uh uh Ephesians chapter 2 we're saved by faith through grace that they tend to take those as absolutes that that faith is, that we are saved by faith through grace end of story and i would say to you that's true but only as long as you're defining faith the way that paul would have defined faith paul would not have defined faith as just simply believing in god that's evidenced by his life you can look at his letter his second letter to the Corinthians, and you particularly when you're in chapters four, five, and six of that letter, that, that you can look at that and see that's not how Paul defined faith in his life. It's not how Paul defined faith uh, even in the book of Ephesians. When you get into chapter four and it talks about the body being held together by what every joint supplies, and then moving into verse 17, it talks about overcoming the old man and putting on the character of God's new man and imitating Christ in, in chapter 5 and walking in love and light and wisdom, uh, putting on the whole armor of God in chapter 6. There, There's nothing about a definition of faith that is just believing that God exists that fits with what Paul says that faith is. That is, that's a, that is a modern interpretation. What, and I say that to say this, there is no disagreement between Paul and James. And I can prove that by going to, to an additional apostle here. You know, we've already talked about the apostle Paul. Um, but we can go over to the book of 1 Peter, and we can look at this in 1 Peter, where it says, beginning in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, this is chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, 
undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. This, this sounds like the introduction to James, doesn't it? So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Christ Jesus. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Now, so he's clearly said there that belief is part of faith. Look at verse 10. As to the salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of the Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven things which angels long to look into. Therefore, here's the other part of faith. You ready? Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to your former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So what does Peter say that faith is? Well, faith absolutely is believing in Jesus, but it is a transformation of our action based on that belief. And I would say to you, there's examples of Paul saying the same thing, and James is saying the same thing, and he's using this depiction of loving our brethren as one of the areas of our lives that ought to be transformed by our faith. So if I have this faith, and part of that faith, according to you know, 1 John, is that I love my brethren, that's part of having faith in Christ, of walking in Christ, then there needs to be evidence of that. Not just belief, not just words, there needs to be evidence that my faith is real or else it's not really faith. Now, the third lesson, shows up much later in the book but it's sort of it's going to call back to some things uh that are mentioned between the between the points um but it really shows up in let's see it really shows up in chapter five just switch translations on myself there sorry about that but it really shows up in james chapter five in verse seven where he's warned about the misuse of riches. He's talked about where the the strife, if, if, if part of faith is loving our brethren and loving our brethren leads us to be gentle and kind and take care of their needs, then you, you run into this problem in chapter 3 where we're, we're being invaded by this worldly wisdom that is sensual and self-serving. And then he asks the question at the beginning of chapter 4, where do the wars and the fightings come from among you? Well, then you get to chapter, you get to the end of chapter 5 and verse 7. It says, therefore. So what, what's the lesson here of all that he said in the book? Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets both the early and the late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. It's kind of taking us back to that first lesson again, isn't it? Do not complain, brethren, against one another so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, who count, we count those blessed who endured you have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and let your no be no so that you may not fall under judgment. And he just continues to talk about this practical application. But I want, I want you to look at where he started that. So what's all the, le if you put all of the book of James together, what's the lesson? That be patient until the coming of the Lord. 
I would say to you that that's really a practical definition of faith. Be patient, be steadfast, endure until the coming of the Lord. Just keep doing the things that God will have you do. Just keep doing the things for your brethren that God would have you do. Just keep turning away from sin the way that God would have you do, trusting that when the Lord comes, he's going to do exactly what he says that he will do. He says, when you do that, you're following the examples of of not only your own brethren, but you're following the examples of the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. You're following in the example of Job. So what do we do? What do we do in the time of this struggle? Well, we need to be patient. We need to strengthen our hearts, and we need to comfort ourselves with the idea that the coming of the Lord is near. And I would say to you, that's probably the third lesson. I say probably because there's lessons in faith that we skipped over in the book just because they're they're kind of locked away in other bigger passages. But But that third lesson there is we ought to be comforted by the coming of the Lord. That's a real test of faith. If the thought that the Lord could return today is comforting to me, then that's a, then then that's indicative of the of at least the possibility that my faith is where it ought to be. If that thought frightens me, if that thought fills me with dread, if that thought takes away my hope, then I ought to go back to that mirror of the word and take another look at it. Because there's something there that's not perfect and complete. And and that was really kind of the story that we see throughout James. He keeps coming back to this idea of the perfect, the complete, that we're striving to be perfect, that we are that we are are doing the things that that not not that just not just doing the things that faithful people do. We are doing the things that we do from the proper motivation that that we that we love God, we love our brethren, we want to wait on God. All of those are part of the book. And really, they ought to be part of our daily walk. That if we stop and we think about what he said, that faith without works is useless. If we stop and think about what he said, that we need to anticipate the coming of the Lord, that that ought to be a comfort to us. Well, it's a comfort to us because it's an end to the trial and it's an end to the difficulties and it's an end to the to the things that don't seem joyful. Then what we see is that we've come back full circle to that first lesson, that faith changes our perspective. Now, the coming of the Lord is a reality. It's going to show that there will be a day when there are no more tomorrows. And that's the day that we look for. Because that's the day when we will understand fully the joy that is set before us. Until then, we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Well, those were three lessons of faith from the book of James. That that faith encourages us to look at things a little differently. Faith is <clears throat> active and that faith is practical. Faith is lived daily and that faith anticipates God making good on those things that he has promised. So how do we put these into effect in our life? Well, I guess that's up to the individual. But I would say that it all starts with taking a deeper look at who we are in relationship to the Word of God so that we can know that that's where where we need to be. Well, it's been good to spend this time with you today. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you got something out of it. Maybe you got a new look at James that you never had before. Regardless, it was time well spent. As always, thanks for being here. Wouldn't be able to do this without you. 
from all of us here at Biblically Speaking, particularly those here in the Bowman House, I want to say, have a good day, and God bless.